my role is just as moderator. Uh, in, in actual life, of course, I'm a consumer of legislative history. Uh, not an altogether happy consumer. Uh, I'm a consumer of it the way I was of cod liver oil as a child. Um, the, the first speaker uh, is former Attorney General Griffin Bell, who was a federal judge for, on the Fifth Circuit for 15 years, then Attorney General for three, uh, and is now uh, a senior member of the firm of King and Spaulding. General Bell. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Williams. I'm a consumer of oversight. Uh, I've been investigated more than anybody in the room, probably more than everybody put together in the room. <clears throat> I've testified in the Congress more than 50 times, and uh, I've seen the uh, oversight function of the Congress grow from a vast <clears throat> small part of the duty of the Congress to something that probably occupies more than 50% of the time of the Congress. Uh, it is uh, probably one of the more serious things uh, facing, the, uh, facing our country in, inside the government, what to do about the oversight power that is now in every subcommittee in the House and the Senate. Some uh, 12 or 15 years ago, some of the champ, two champ, champ people in the House were removed, and uh, a great power passed to the subcommittee chairman. That is the root of the great uh, increase in the uh, oversight function of the Congress, I think. Uh, if there's no mechanism at all in the House or the Senate to where well, you have to get permission before you can start one of these wide-ranging investigations. There's no executive committee, or there's no authority that allows, uh, that regulates these sorts of things. So we have seen the, uh, I don't know the increase in the size of the employees in the Congress, but it's been tremendous. If we did just two things, uh, we would, I think, would bring the oversight uh, problem under control, and probably the people in the Congress think it is not a problem. I, they would disagree with me. I think the, um, if we had some, some group on the top level, maybe the uh, uh, speaker in the House and the majority and minority leaders and the uh, same in this sort of thing in the Senate, that you had to get prior approval before you could start an oversight investigation, uh, at least before you could have a hearing, uh, you would cause a downsizing in the a number of people working in the Congress. Uh, every company in America today is engaged in downsizing, but I've not seen any sign of downsizing the government. A good place to start would be in the Congress and then let it spread from there. <laughs> we have uh, seen the government grow in enormous numbers uh, in, since the Watergate, about that time. That was a watershed in, in the history of our country. So. Uh, we now have a Congress where, until a year ago, uh, the House seemed to be in charge of the foreign policy of the country. Uh, the president was sort of out of it after the Iran Contra, which is the biggest oversight here and we've seen. Uh, that all has settled down. Things are looking a lot better in the last year. The Congress seems to be going back to doing what it's supposed to do, and the president's doing what he ought to be doing. And, and uh, if we'd had this meeting a year ago, uh, we could say uh, we could feel a lot worse about the way things are, but things are they're doing pretty well, I think. We have to remember that the, uh, there's been a great shift in power to the Congress. For example, the Congress has its own Justice Department. They've done that by creating inspector generals in all of the cabinet agencies and also by the, uh, creating the Office of Special Prosecutor. Judge uh, Walsh is an uh, Iran Contra operation. Uh, is as large as some of the sections in the Department of Justice. Just that one matter going on. And we've got a number of special prosecutors loose in the country at the same time. All of that is uh, given more power to the Congress. With respect to, uh, and that's my general view about the, about the oversight. I, I think it, uh, it'll be very difficult to bring about this reform, but we, Congress has to do it. They have, Congress needs to go and study 
the House and the Senate separately ought to study just what, what it is they want to be doing, as Senator Rob said, in the next 10 years, up, up to the year 2000. We do that at our law firm, every business does that, and Congress ought to be doing things like that. And they ought to decide just what, what, what they ought to be doing. How much time are they giving to the legislative function? Uh, what are they doing about some of the great problems in the country? We know about the drug problem and the deficit problem, but I would say that maybe one of the, the greatest problem we have in the country is how to reduce the size of the underclass. If the underclass keeps growing, they'll be in the majority. And we have to simply reduce the size of the underclass, underclass and bring them into the uh, normal group of people in the country. And if we don't do that, we're just uh, setting up a time bomb, which will eventually uh, go off. Those are the sort of things that Congress ought to be functioning on, functioning uh, as a part of their function. I think that uh, if they would spend less time investigating, uh, and I don't look for them to do this unless there's some mechanism put in to control it, because so long as there's a media, so long as there's a television camera, if you, if you uh, have the power, you're the head of a subcommittee, to get a hearing going that will generate news, you, you're very apt to have a hearing. So there's a sort of a relationship between television and the old site function in the Congress. So there's it's got to be some high authority to bring it under control. With respect to uh, le legislative history, in the hearings that I've said uh, uh, go along with the old site, I will mention one thing about the hearing. When I was up for, to be confirmed as Attorney General, I was the only witness, and there were a lot of witnesses against me, I was the only witness that testified on the oath. And I finally asked the chairman of the committee after one witness testified, if he had mind putting him on oath, on the oath and let him and call him back, and let him just say all the things he had said, uh, he they never did it. Uh, <laughs> and the whole hearing, which lasted almost two weeks, I was the only witness that ever testified on the oath, which I thought was quite a remarkable thing in America. That everyone, everyone testifying against me could testify not on the oath, but I was on the oath. I think uh, that probably has been corrected uh, by now. But the hearings uh, leave a great deal to be desired in the way of due process. And uh, I don't suggest that we ought to have a court hearing when you have a congressional hearing, but uh, it's pretty hard on people that are not able to function in bright lights and with cameras going off in your face and, uh, and television. There were probably some of these people that uh, called to testify and who may really be, end up being indicted. Uh, Probably, uh, if they testify, they, they may, may have never had the experience of testifying on a public hearing. So a little more due process wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. Now, with respect to legislative history, just a word. I was a judge for a long time, and I understand the legislative history system. And I came to the conclusion that finally that when you leave the uh, committee report, the majority and the minority reports, you, you might as well stop there. There's a lot of this skullduggery, I call it, that goes on where if you're losing, you then get up on the floor and you make some statements that undercut what the, what's, what the law that's about to be passed. You, you are able to water it down some by statements, and the only reason to make them is you think there'll be some poor sucker out there somewhere, some judge that wouldn't have sense <laughs> enough to know that. And that your favorite judges might take what you one person said, a senator or a congressman, and totally change the meaning of the law. So I, my view is that the uh, report of the majority and the minority ought to be the legislative history, and that ought to be, it speaks for itself, and that's as far as it goes. I think uh, our lawmaking would be a lot better off if we did that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Gordon Krovitz of the Wall Street Journal editorial staff. Uh, he was on the editorial staff. He was a, a Rhodes Scholar on the editorial staff of the Wall Street Journal, then went to the Yale Law School and returned, uh, educated in that form, uh, <laughs> to the Wall Street Journal. Well, thank you very much. 
Um, I'd like to uh, start this morning by making a modest proposal. The President should issue an order to all the officials in the executive branch that they refuse all kind invitations to come speak before congressional committees until one condition is met. It doesn't matter to me whether the congressional carpenters have to lower one set of seats or raise another set, but these are co-equal political branches. Presidential officials should flatly, absolutely, totally refuse to appear before any congressional hearing where the members of Congress are seated above the witness. <laughs> Now, if this proposal sounds too assertive for a president to make, I have come armed with a statesmanlike compromise. The Constitution does not say one word about congressional investigations or oversight of the executive branch, nor equally does it say one word about presidential investigations or oversight of members of Congress. My compromise is this. The executive branch mirror congressional hearings with its own hearings into the legislative branch. <laughs> Did Congressman X, for example, lie when he promised President Reagan that he would vote for budget cuts in exchange for tax increases? <laughs> Did Senator Y mislead the executive branch when he claimed that the CIA had never told him about mining of a harbor? Why did Senators A, B, C, D, and E, that makes a Keating five, uh, <laughs> why did these senators straight arm a federal regulator of an industry whose bailout will cost us all billions of dollars? Now, many of you might object that these are rather wild proposals uh, that would inflame animosity between the two branches. And while I would say this would not necessarily be a bad thing, uh, I don't <laughs> think that this is the effect that it would have. Uh, if congressmen knew that they might get similar treatment when they haul up executive branch officials to Capitol Hill, they might spend more time legislating, less time in stuffy hearing rooms. Who knows, they might even get a budget out on time. Now, it is always appropriate before the Federalist Society to look to see what the Constitution actually says about a subject. And so I thumbed through the Constitution for the word oversight, couldn't find it, did find this. Uh, Article 2, Section 3 says that the President shall, from time to time, give to the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. The annual State of the Union Address, which was initiated by President Washington, is a direct result of this affirmative duty on the President to provide information. But on what grounds does Congress seek more than that? The necessary and proper clause has alone been adequate, strangely enough, to warrant extraordinary congressional intrusion. There was a case in the 1920s uh, involving a Senate investigation of the Attorney General uh, that established that either House of Congress can compel private citizens by subpoena to give testimony to a committee. The Supreme Court in that case acknowledged that there is no provision in the Constitution investing either House with power to make investigations and exact testimony to the end that it may exercise its legislative function advisedly and effectively. As you can tell from the language of the Supreme Court, they did find that the power was nonetheless there. The justices relied largely on the necessary and proper clause, arguing that gathering information is necessarily incident to writing legislation. No general limits on this power exist, though I think a good argument can be made that the hearings must at least be for gathering information for possible legislation. Uh, and not for some broad fishing expedition to somehow embarrass executive branch officials. Consider for a moment the constitutional questions that might arise if Congress decided to subpoena members of the Supreme Court or clerks to Supreme Court justices to demand why they had ruled in a case in a certain way or why they had denied cert in a certain case. Uh, who thinks that this would be constitutional congressional oversight over the courts? As Judge Silverman uh, might put the question uh, based on his comments yesterday, what court would uphold such a subpoena? <laughs> Today's innumerable hearings clearly interfere with any efficient running of executive departments. As Terry Eastland said yesterday, 
separation of powers issues must be judged in part on whether a congressional practice saps the energy the founders intended would reside in the executive branch. The very language involved, oversight, confusingly creates the illusion that Congress oversees the executive branch. It is, I think, more accurate, constitutionally speaking, to say that if there is one branch that has some power called oversight, it is the executive branch. It is the president who has a constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. For example, every year since its passage, Congress has violated the 1974 Budget and Empowerment Control Act by failing to pass one or more of the budget bills on time. Now, maybe the president has an opportunity or indeed a duty to see that this law, as others, is faithfully executed. I don't think it amounts to a crime, but maybe he should have oversight hearings. Now, I don't think oversight in this sense from either Congress or the executive branch was at all how the Constitution envisioned separation of powers functioning. The powers are separated. They are also different. It makes no sense to speak of congressional oversight of pardons or congressional oversight of vetoes. These are obviously uniquely presidential powers. Where we draw the line, I'm not sure. Uh, but I do suggest that the current level of oversight raises some constitutional questions as well as practical ones. Congress, as we all know, now demands innumerable hearings uh, from private citizens and executive branch officials alike, and has established several other institutional ways of gathering information from the executive branch about the State of the Union. Representative John Dingell, of course, is king. He regularly intervenes in the prosecution of legal cases by calling hearings. He's even been known to name particular uh, defendants, uh, including securities firms and others that he wants the Justice Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission to investigate. Congress also has a General Accounting Office, the Congressional Budget Office, the Congressional Research Service, and others. Let me give you a flavor just for a moment of how high-ranking administration officials these days actually spend their time. Take the Defense Department. In 1960, we spent about 10% of gross national product on defense. We now spend about half that. In 1960, two congressional committees had oversight over Pentagon spending. Until the Carter administration, just four committees wrote defense legislation. Now there are 107 committees and subcommittees that oversee defense. One single assistant secretary, Richard Armitage, was called to testify more than 150 times over a seven-year period during the Reagan administration. Now, what is the result of all of this? Someone from the Heritage Foundation actually measured the number of linear feet of laws and regulations on defense procurement. He found that the total is 1,152 feet of library shelving. The Pentagon now gets 100,000 official written inquiries from Congress every year which comes to about four requests for every week from each one of the 535 members. Congress demanded 36 annual reports or studies from the Pentagon in 1970, 114 in 1976, 231 in 1980, and 719 in 1988. It is no surprise that there are now 500,000 employees in the various procurement departments of the Pentagon to deal with all the congressional demands. Now these reports often lead to hearings that are, in truth, often no more than low-grade fevers in the constant effort of the legislative branch to usurp executive branch functions. But Congress has, in this decade, this past decade, become impatient and transformed hearings into something much more threatening and dangerous. This is part of what has now come to be called Congress's criminalizing of policy differences with the executive branch. I had thought that Congress several years ago had perfected the art of calling executive branch officials in to testify, then criminalizing their testimony. The best example may be what happened during the Reagan administration to an assistant attorney general in the Justice Department in the Office of Legal Counsel uh, who was called in to testify about a claim of executive privilege arising during one of the epic battles Representative John Dingell uh, was involved in over the EPA. Uh, the official testified. Two years later, a 3,000-page report was issued from the Democratic members of the House Judiciary Committee demanding an independent counsel to investigate whether he had misled Congress. 
Under the hair trigger rules that Congress passed for the Ethics and Government Act, an independent counsel was appointed. Three years later, the independent counsel reported there was no reasons to proceed with any indictment. The target, of course, was Theodore Olson, who spoke yesterday, uh, who has the uh, distinction of being criminally investigated for doing his job of advising his client, the president. Now, Congress, I think, has now come up with an even better way of criminalizing its policy differences with the executive branch through congressional hearings. The first issue raised in the appeal of the conviction of Oliver North, which will be argued next month, is that he did not get a fair trial before, because Congress had demanded that he come testify under immunity. He was compelled to testify despite his Fifth Amendment claim. Uh, and the appeal argues uh, this violated his rights. So we now have uh, the possibility of a one, two, three punch by Congress of one, calling an executive branch witness to testify two, demanding appointment of independent counsel to criminally investigate, and three, having a trial where the bulk of the information was divulged in what was supposed to be immunized testimony. Uh, it will be interesting to see what the appeals court makes of this argument and the rather obvious separation of powers issues here. I started with a couple of modest proposals. I'd like to end by endorsing another one. Uh, several members of the current administration have been thinking about how they can avoid uh, future problems of congressional pressure tactics uh, of the savings and loan kind. Uh, they have not, to my knowledge, uh, considered asking uh, five senators in for a set of presidential hearings. Uh, they have, however, at least in one executive department, tried out a rule that I think would, be, uh, would have very good effect, and that would be to make public all communications by members of Congress or the staff of members of Congress with any executive branch official. This sunshine provision would uh, give the public uh, a better understanding of what Congress now means by the phrase constituent services. <laughs> uh, the department, uh, this was tried out in one department. Uh, the Secretary of the Interior last year demanded that his staff log all communications with members of Congress or their staff. Uh, keeping a record seemed to him like a good idea. Uh, it might give people an idea of how the government now works. But this policy was not in effect long before members of Congress uh, heard about it and became uh, enraged. So as Attorney General Thornburg said yesterday, they inserted the following into the Interior Department uh, appropriation bill. None of the funds available under this title may be used to prepare reports on contacts between employees of the Department of the Interior and members and committees of Congress and their staff. I'm told that when the White House Counsel's Office heard about uh, this, they uh, warned Congress that this sounded unconstitutional to them. And indeed, they even threatened to use this uh, provision as a test case for the theory that the President has the inherent line item veto. Uh, with this, Congress caved, and they changed the provision to what strikes me as a remarkable uh, provision. This was passed, uh, this provision was passed in mid-October. And it said, uh, this section, referring to the ban on, appropriate, on appropriations for logging, uh, this section shall be effective only on October 1, 1989. That's what the provision said. So what this means is that the Interior Department cannot spend any funds to log contacts with members of Congress or their staff only on one day, the day of October 1st, which had already passed by the time the provision was passed, uh, so, in fact, October 1st was a Sunday. Uh, so this applied only retroactively to a day that had already passed that was a Sunday, uh, which was the kind of day when members of Congress probably did not call people in the Interior Department. Uh, so we do have some precedent for the executive branch to fight back against congressional hearings, investigations, and oversight by threatening some of this medicine against Congress itself. It does seem to me that for the good of the executive branch and the legislative branch, uh, for the good of an energetic executive uh, and for the possibility that Congress can someday actually pass a budget, uh, we should have less oversight of the executive by Congress and more of Congress keeping its own eye on its own responsibilities. Thank you.
Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Professor Peter Strauss of the Columbia Law School, uh, who is editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal and general counsel of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, thanks very much. I didn't have nearly the opportunity that uh, General Bell had uh, of appearing before the Congress, but I do remember uh, most prominently the um, one of them, which was flying out to San Francisco with all but two witnesses in a forthcoming hearing, every member of Congress and their staff in a forthcoming hearing, while Congress was in session, but in September of an election year to appear in a hearing in the chair, subcommittee chairman's home district uh, to uh, examine some terrible scandal that had uh, rocked of uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, for which I was then general counsel, and that made its um, own impression. Uh, it turns out, I think, that I'm the member of the panel to talk to you about a legislative history. Uh, we've heard uh, a couple of quite illuminating remarks about um, oversight, uh, with which I'm largely in agreement in a philosophical way, uh, although uh, then when the question comes, well, you know, why is this happening? Uh, and is there anything to be done about it? Uh, the issues become perhaps more difficult, uh, and you'll, you'll find in my remarks what I'm going to attempt to do uh, is address what seem to me some complications that may arise uh, from, from, from the current distaste for legislative history uh, that may make that problem even a little bit worse. Uh, in a preliminary way, though, I want to note uh, that the conference has proceeded in an interesting way. Yesterday was the President's Day. Uh, today is Congress's Day. Yesterday, on the whole, I thought the, the panelists were presidential boosters. Um, pretty clearly today, uh, at least to judge by the evidence already in and some sense about what might be coming, uh, what we have are a group of, of congressional trashers. Uh, and what, what then is missing here uh, and, and what I want uh, particularly to call attention to is a sense of the tension that underlies uh, this great uh, document, uh, which, is, uh, which is at the root of, of, of this uh, quite interesting uh, conference. After all, and I think I can say this as, as uh, one of the supporters of the idea of the unitary president, uh, while the Constitution creates a unitary president, as, as was amply uh, evidenced in yesterday's remarks, uh, it also, just as clearly, says that Congress is in charge of giving the government shape. That's the necessary and proper clause. Uh, and it just as clearly, uh, in the provision on which White House counsel relied in that stunning response to the Department of Interior uh, appropriations measure, uh, the, the written opinion clause, of the Constitution. It says the President can demand the written opinion of the head of any of the executive departments on the duties of their respective departments. So there it is. The President has the constitutional authority, and through him the Secretary of Interior, to demand anything in writing uh, he chooses from the heads of his departments relating to any matter within his, his ken. So clearly, that was a right opinion, an imaginative opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, but at the same time, it talks about the duties of the heads of the departments. And so all the talk yesterday about how the president is the one who has the right to decide matters seems to me to have been in uh, a derogation of that quite explicit congressional rec uh, constitutional recognition <clears throat> that duties can be put someplace else than in the president consistently with the constitutional scheme of having a unitary president. The document is full of tensions, and it is to its tensions that I want to call your attention in the context of the problem of legislative history. What I want to do is sketch a problem for you, and I want you to imagine uh, that you are the general counsel of a regulatory body, as I once was, it would be obvious enough where I came to this problem from. Uh, she knows whether or not theory tells her that her agency is in a complex series of relationships with a variety of oversight bodies, uh, with Congress, with, uh, with the President, with, for that matter, uh, Judge Williams uh, and the other uh, members of the courts. Uh, she is always dealing with questions of legal authority. Uh, and when she does so, uh, she does it in an important pair of contexts. 
Uh, one of them is, and it seems to me a central one, maintaining the commitment to legality. Uh, what is it in my handling of this problem for my clients that will convince the court that there aren't delegation problems here? That the action that my client wants to undertake is affirmatively authorized. She's constantly overseeing analyses of agency authority, reasoning from the agency's statutes, and from whatever may be the appropriate materials of construction of those statutes. The second is, and this isn't so often noticed, I think, um, what I might describe as the bulwark against politics. And here I don't care whether we are talking about the politics of Congress or the politics of the President, although it is certainly the case, uh, as uh, Lloyd Cutler reminded us last night, that having a divided government makes this issue the much more complex and the much more important for all of us. Where are the limits, if there are any, past which oversight from any source, political oversight from any source, can't properly reach? When should her principal be able to say, I'm sorry, Mr. President, or I'm sorry, Madam Representative, I can't do that. The law doesn't permit it. Now, there was a decision some years ago in the Chevron case, of which you probably know and of which I am a, a fan, uh, that not inappropriately underscored the importance of these issues and of the agency's roles in relationship to them. Uh, the fact is uh, that Congress is often less than fully decisive or clear in resolving issues. Uh, the agency has uh, the responsibility and the place in the web of politics and law, in the tension, if you like, between politics and law, that suggests that it may be the best resolver of those uncertainties that endure. And moreover, the fact is that circumstances change. Presidents change, the problems with which one must deal change, the surrounding envelope of law and expectation taken as a whole changes. And Chevron recognizes this, too, as a reason for primary agency administration of disputable issues of statutory meaning. It anticipates that meanings will change with time. The problem comes when you bring into the picture the move away from legislative history, uh, the growing sense that this is illegitimate stuff from which to construct statutory interpretations. We're accustomed to thinking about that problem in the context of the courts. Should Judge Bell uh, or Judge Williams have looked at this stuff in their capacity as members of the judicial branch? We don't think about it from the perspective of the general counsel. Is this an instruction to the general counsel as well as to the courts that she ought not to attend to legislative history anymore? And if it is, what might it mean? One way of stating that problem, maybe the easiest way of seeing it, uh, is one that I imagine the folks in this room will, uh, will applaud as changing somewhat the balance between presidential and congressional oversight uh, in a way that empowers the president at the expense of the Congress. Uh, that's maybe congenial enough uh, to Republicans in an era of divided government when we're going to have a Republican White House and a Democrat Congress uh, for a long time. Uh, and one notes that the justices who were loudest in praise of plain meeting were all appointed by Republican presidents and imagine some possibility of a connection there. Um, there is a twofold, it seems to me, empowerment of the president. In dealings with the president, the general counsel and her agency has lost some of her weapons to resist policy guidance. If she can't say, given the legislative history, we can't read the statute that way. Uh, the agency is the repository of expert knowledge about the legislative process that generated or failed to generate statutory change. Whatever may be the case for the judge who will occasionally encounter problems of legislative history, she and her staff are unlikely to be suckers about it. They're going to understand it pretty well. And for that matter, they'll have a fair amount of help in understanding it and responding to it, as we have often heard. So legislative history provides a means for resisting the president on the sleeve of Congress. Uh, Chevron, after all, invites the president to attempt control. Legislative history for the agency gives some kinds of means associated, at least fictionally, with law for resisting that. The second way in which the president is empowered is that the abandonment of legislative history weakens Congress's controls. Or maybe it would be more apt to say, weakens the controls that could be thought to continue to work on behalf of the enacting Congress. Only the deposit of words remains from them. The president has gained weapons. The Congress, in a sense, has lost them. And you may be thinking, this is not so bad. And they have been complaining to you about one of them, the Oversight Congress, 
as distinct from the legislating Congress. Congress ought to legislate, it ought not to oversee. Uh, the legislating Congress is the one that generates statutes and legislative history too, however imperfect and manufactured that may be. Uh, and uh, I'm a little over time. Okay, well, I'll do what I can. Uh, I won't take. I, I yield five. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he's got a friend. Uh, <laughs> uh, however imperfect and manufactured it may be, the Constituent Service Oversight uh, Congress, the one that we've heard amply about this morning, acting, if you like, as, an ex as a counter executive, is the one that attempts to influence agency action in the here and now without passing statutes. Separation of powers theory wants us to make us emphasize the legislating Congress. I think that's just right. Uh, but public choice theory focuses our attention on the counter-executive oversight Congress, the place where members learn it is most efficient to put their efforts. Uh, the phenomenon of divided government adds to that. Uh, and what I think you ought to bear in mind is that letting go of legislative history is a way of putting a premium on oversight by making it more profitable to the congressman who's deciding whether to pay attention to his role as a member of the legislating Congress or his role as a member of the oversight Congress to pay attention to his role as a member of the oversight Congress because making legislation doesn't count as much anymore. What he does in making legislation doesn't count as much anymore. And beyond that, since the agency, hypothetically, is not going to be paying nearly as much attention to what went on during the process of legislating as it previously did. He's going to have to put that much more energy into oversight to see to it in the here and now that it hews the line, that it stays on track. So that um, I don't see that moving away from legislative history will be helpful in dealing with the problems of the Congress that I think quite properly exercise uh, uh, some mem the members of the panel uh, 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 this morning. OK. Um, one, other, one other aspect of that. Um, it is, repeat, I suppose, something already said. Um, it is important to think about who it is that the legislator is thinking about in generating legislative history. To be sure, sometimes she's thinking about the suckers, the judges, if you like, who might be fooled. But I think most of the time, and I think almost everyone understands this, where Congress creates an agency to do its job or expects an agency to do its job, and usually these days for reasons over which we have little control, that's the way things will be. The legislator is thinking about that agent. Uh, and here the legitimacy of the dialogue has been conceded for decades before Chevron in such propositions as the appropriateness of deferring to those who participated in the drafting process or to those first responsible for putting into effect what Congress had done. Political history inescapably surrounds legislation and colors the understanding of it, but this too may be disregarded. And that's where the emphasis on additional oversight is going to come in, because devaluing legislative history has no negative implication for Congress's counter-executive functions. OK? If you followed me this far, it seems to me, you might accept the characterization that telling the general counsel she oughtn't to pay any attention to legislative history could be thought to raise just the sorts of separation of power questions as the Federalist Society and others have insisted that seems to me quite appropriately were presented by the legislative veto. It will divert effort from legislating to acting as a shadow executive, of which we have already seen much too much. It will diminish the claim of the Congress that legislates on law and on the control of executive action. It will weaken the agency's weapons of defense against unstructured contemporary political oversight from either the president or the Congress, and to that extent it will even enhance the power of Congress and what I take to be its undesirable counter-executive mode. If I can be spared another couple of minutes, I want to put before you an even more important tension, I think, that this problem suggests. And that is the tension between politics and law. This isn't a defense of legislative history. I'm on record agreeing that it has its abuses. 
Um, yet Justice Kennedy's opinion last term in Public Citizen as much as suggested that abandoning it was required by the separation of powers, that the Constitution imposes the plain meaning rule on the courts as a rule of construction. And that's what started me worrying about these implications for agency practice and has brought me to the tentative conclusion, may not sound tentative, um, that Justice Kennedy had the proposition just wrong that a healthy regard for separation of powers principles requires us to shore up the behavior of the Congress that legislates against the Congress that plays it to the shadow executive. It may be appropriate to put this argument in Madisonian terms. In the 51st Federalist, Madison described the great difficulty in framing a government to be administered by men over men as this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and in the next place oblige it to control itself. The rich context for understanding legislative history provides that for understanding that legislative history provides has long served within government as one of those means by which bureaucracies, bureaucracies control themselves and do so within what my friend Peter Shane has described as the culture of the rule of law. Chevron and public citizen taken together significantly substitute the culture of politics for the culture of law. Even if there were short run advantages to such a step, I should think conservatives would want to think long and hard before taking it, and I should hope they would think back. I want to close uh, with what strikes me as a wonderful passage uh, that Robert Holt puts in the mouth of St. Thomas More in his play, A Man for All Seasons, as a way of illustrating the hazards of the culture of politics. Uh, More is talking with his son-in-law, Roper, Rich, a uh, evil character who will bring about More's downfall, has just left the stage. Roper, uh, while you talk, he's gone. And he should go if he was the devil himself until he broke the law. So now you'd give the devil the benefit of the law. Yes, what would you do? Cut a great swath through the law to get after the devil? I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws being all flat? This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the one to do it, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, I'd give the devil the benefit of law for my own safety's sake. Thank you. Our final speaker is Michael Davidson, who since the creation of the office in 1979 has been Senate legal counsel. He has duties relating to defending the Senate's position in matters such as the independent counsel, uh, the pocket veto, and separation of powers generally. He was formerly chief staff counsel of the DC circuit, and from him I've inherited a secretary. Uh, also pleased to live in the 3700 block of McKinley Street with him. Uh, Michael? When the organizers of, uh, of the meeting asked me to substitute for someone last week, uh, I said I'd probably not come with a prepared set of remarks, but uh, I would feel confident that there would be matters to respond to, and, uh, and I'm sure there, <laughs> there are. <laughs> As to um, Gordon's uh, modest proposal that at uh, congressional hearings um, there be a condition that, um, that members sit at a uh, common table with uh, members of the executive branch, I think there's a great deal that's compelling about it. And it would be particularly persuasive when the next time we argue a separation of powers case at the DC Circuit, the judges might come down to council table and uh, just uh, chat with us. Uh, and maybe we could all work it out. Um, the, the, the several subtopics uh, that were assigned to this panel, oversight hearings, uh, investigations, and legislative history, I think deal with uh, the, the common question whether uh, the Congress, when it acts short of placing precisely in the text of statute uh, a directive to uh, private entities or uh, to other parts of, of the government, may uh, control behavior elsewhere. Um, and, of course, there's probably another panel that deals with uh, the problems that arise when the Congress, uh, with excessive detail, 
uh, controls the behavior of executive agencies and whether the Congress is then micromanaging the executive branch. Uh, and then when the Congress delegates uh, more broadly, the Public Citizen Litigation Group is out there is saying that uh, the Congress has improperly delegated its legislative power. It's frankly very difficult to get it all right. Uh, the, the question that I think comes on the first part of, uh, of that uh, discussion of the subjects that unite the various themes of this panel, investigations, hearings, and, and oversight, and they probably are in many instances the same thing, uh, I think present these matters. Problems do not come to the Congress in a tidy way. Uh, we had a, a small case before the D.C. Circuit uh, involving a subpoena to a member, uh, and one of the um, issues raised by the party seeking to enforce the subpoena is that the subpoena didn't call for uh, legislative uh, testimony about the legislative views of the member. Uh, dealt with um, perhaps the member's uh, political activities or the member's activities in, involved in oversight, or perhaps the member's activities involved in learning about a legislative problem. Uh, and in the course of the argument, uh, uh, Judge Buckley, who of course have, has seen uh, matters from uh, at least the perspective of two branches, uh, did say, yes, it's true, problems did not come into my office labeled uh, constituent services, uh, oversight, legislation, and uh, where I would know which file to put that in. They come in as problems. Uh, and it would, of course, I think, be the, the wrong thing, and I'm sure many of you would think to be the wrong thing, to assume that all problems are legislative problems. All problems call for another statute which more precisely uh, prescribes uh, the permissible activities of people outside of, of the Congress. Uh, when an issue comes in, it could be any number of things. It could be something that is resolved by a communication. It could be uh, resolved by exposing a problem to some form of public scrutiny. And maybe it needs to be resolved by legislation or maybe it doesn't need to be dealt with at, at all. Uh, and so to, to argue for less oversight and more legislation is to push everything into the category in which hard lines are drawn uh, in, the, you know, in the firmest way possible. Uh, and I don't think anyone would deny that a legislative branch needs information. And how is it to obtain information but to, uh, to inquire? And, and sometimes inquiry produces the information, and sometimes it has to be obtained in more formal ways. But you certainly wouldn't want a group of people sitting around drafting laws and not knowing very much about what they're writing laws about. Uh, and I also think that. Um, you probably, and I say you, I mean all of us, uh, you know, probably pr prefer that uh, many times uh, matters be done informally, but that there is some virtue in formality. Uh, when a, a, a member of Congress or a committee of Congress has a problem with an executive agency or with a regulatory body, uh, there are times when that is best done on a public record. I mean, the equivalent of logging in contacts is having an open forum in which people come and answer questions in an open setting in which there are uh, investigators, congressional investigators of both parties, uh, some of uh, whom may be supporting that position and eliciting uh, you know, information, probing with questions that support a particular point of view and others uh, who may be critical of that point of view. And that kind of open inquiry uh, is not possible, or is diminished at least, when everything is pushed into a quieter and more secluded setting. So that the very objective of, of, of being sure uh, that there is accountability to the questioner as well as to the person questioned uh, speaks for doing a lot of this in an, in an open setting. On legislative history, um, I'd like to say that there, in thinking about this panel, I did look at cases which uh, I have not dealt with uh, directly. We don't involve ourselves uh, in statutory interpretation except where those issues tend to involve uh, the distribution of powers between the branches. But in looking at them, I 
those cases in recent years, I have become quite concerned about the nature of the debate. It seems to me that uh, any process of judicial examination of statutes that disregards uh, the formation of statutes uh, loses for the judicial branch a source of great insights into uh, the reason for legislative action. And without answering in any particular case uh, whether statement on the floor or colloquy, uh, a, a, an observation in a report should control the interpretation of a particular law, you wouldn't want to start a judicial decision, the reading of a judicial decision, uh, by simply reading the broadest principle enunciated in that decision without having a sense of the factual context from which that decision emerges. And that's why uh, judges do more than simply announce their conclusions, but they will tell you what the facts of a case were. And I would think that you wouldn't want to start with a statute without having some sense of where that statute came from. Um, knowing what, what information is communicated to the Congress from the outside as, uh, as reproduced in the hearings of, uh, of, of committees, and then as, um, as Judge Bell indicated, uh, looking very carefully at committee reports. And I would think, of course, you want to be very careful, as with any product. Uh, with a judicial product, um, uh, everyone, including other judges, want to be careful with uh, footnotes that uh, may have been crafted by law clerks, just as Justice Scalia is concerned that uh, portions of committee reports may be drafted by young staffers. There is a great contribution in all branches. I would think you'd want to be careful in looking at a presidential signing statement, whether some observation on the separation of powers uh, was more the feelings of the Office of Legal Counsel than it was the uh, ponderings of the president. On, on that issue. Uh, we, uh, we live in large organizations, all of us, uh, and there are contributions which come up uh, and there is a level at which uh, final products are read and, and recrafted and I'm sure probably more in the judicial branch than in any other branch, uh, but it's necessary to read all final products with some care to understand what the heart of a decision is, what the heart of a statute is, and what are the contributions of uh, of, of others along the way. Uh, but without having a sense of where a statute has come from, it must be very hard to interpret it. Uh, and it may be an approach that leads to conflicts that are absolutely unnecessary. And um, if I could pick up on, uh, on Peter's discussion of, uh, of the case involving the Advisory Committee Act, which is the public citizen case in which uh, uh, Peter mentioned uh, Justice Kennedy's decision. That was a case in which a uh, claim was made that the proceedings, at least to some extent, of the um, American Bar Association in screening federal judges should be open to public scrutiny under the Advisory Committee Act. Uh, now, there is a current topicality to that question uh, and a uh, a division within the Congress about the proper role of the ABA. But if you look back over time, uh, with great confidence, you would know that at the time of drafting the Advisory Committee Act, that no one intended to regulate that communication. That was simply not the issue before the Congress at that time. No one sought to open to scrutiny that kind of direct advice by the American Bar Association to the Department of Justice and the President on the qualifications of judicial nominees. If all that you had was uh, the literal language of the statute, maybe the language of the statute could be read in that way. But that would immediately produce an enormous constitutional problem. And no one should be disposed to think that the Congress has walked into a constitutional conflict with the executive unwittingly. I mean, those have got to be the, uh, the rarest kinds of public uh, controversies. It occurred in the independent counsel matter. That was a, a knowing decision to, uh, uh, to structure government in a way differently than the executive thought uh, it should be structured under the Constitution. Uh, there is a history there, and when the case finally ar ar arose, it was not by accident. Uh, 
but it would have been quite by accident to rule on the president's power to receive advice and the constitutionality of an act of Congress, which may have structured that in connection with the Advisory Committee Act, because the Congress simply wasn't picking that fight. And a, an approach to construction which seeks to understand whether that was really an issue before the Congress, whether this was a statute that sought to set lines, which would then cause the court to invoke a very rare power of judging the constitutionality of the statute of the separation of powers, uh, is one that you should come to only reluctantly, with some certainty that that was what was intended, using all the materials available, and not foreclosing any of them because of fixed rules that either nothing counts, which is a view that apparently is being entertained, or that very little counts, except for uh, final words. Uh, statutes have a, have a life just as judicial decisions and presidential statements, uh, and to understand them requires some amount of, of, of work beyond what you see when you first uh, uh, confront it. Well, with that, I'm sure there are many questions, and let me turn it back to the moderator for, for those. It appears to be traditional to let the members of the panel have uh, a couple of minutes uh, in rebuttal if they wish. Before they start that, I I'd like to exercise the prerogative of the chair to ask Peter Strauss a question. I was struck by your argument on uh, downgrading legislative history, possibly diverting uh, Congress into more into oversight activity. And you, you divide it up into sort of the legislative function versus the oversight function. The question that arose in my mind was whether the legislative history creation function is legislative in, a, in any true sense of the word. Uh, it seems to me that the, the, the setting sin of Congress is the problem of splintering. I mean, it's its strength as well, of course, representing many different uh, interest groups. Uh, but it is through the legislative process of producing something which is affirmatively voted on by a majority, that that is counteracted. And that constraint uh, disappears for the creation of legislative history. So I, I raise the question for you whether uh, incentives to the generation of legislative history can genuinely be regarded as incentives to the legislative function. Um, uh, sure. Uh, I think they can, uh, but I, and I, in saying that, I don't want to deny that legislative history is often abused, is the subject of lobbyists' efforts, and so forth and so on. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that occurs in the context of legislating. This is the constitutional moment. To the extent folks are aware, they're aware at that constitutional moment, and particularly in the context I speak to, spoke to which is the context not of the general public, uh, or for that matter of the court, but of the agency. Uh, when one has a statute pending on the Hill, one knows perfectly well what's going on. One's very much in on that process, if you like. And the understanding that is generated out of that includes understandings on the congressional side, as well as on the, um, as well as on the agency side. Uh, about what is meant. Now, one may say, all right, but some of these are private understandings, and, and that doesn't wash very well. Um, not the ones that find their way into legislative history. Uh, with all its, its imperfections, legislative history that counts in any sense is a public and enduring uh, record. Uh, and I suppose the other thing to say um, in that regard, unless it's gone out of mind, um, well, perhaps it has. Leave it at that. Uh, General Bell, you want to Well, the, uh, I was struck by Peter's argument myself because um, when I was Attorney General, we, it was a rare thing for the general counsel of an agency to ever ask uh, the Office of Legal Counsel for an opinion. Uh, somehow or another, every, all the agency general counsel uh, will do anything but ask for an opinion where they ought to seek an opinion sometimes. And uh, I think it, the Office of Legal Counsel is probably uh, next to the courts uh, the most ex has more expertise in construing statutes, uh, legislative history. You know, the Justice Department's got people keeping up with legislation too. And a lot of this would be cured if we uh, simply 
ask the Office of Legal Counsel more often for an opinion. I don't know of any better way to handle legislative uh, history than to go by the committee reports. Uh, they are usually extensive, uh, comprehensive, and if there's dissenting views, they'll be in the dissenting opinion. Uh, I think I always uh, followed the uh, Cardozo's uh, nature of the judicial process where he said that the duty of the judge was to take the statute and fill in testicles that were left in the statute. And you do that by looking at the legislative history. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, fail to look at some statement some senator made, but you usually can pick up if you if you lived a while that that statement might be undercutting. He lost his battle, so he's making some undercutting remarks. That sort of thing. And a lot of lawyers will come in and argue in that position, but most judges are going to that. The, the fugitive thought has come back to roost. The committee system is part of the legislative process, after all. We fool ourselves if we think of debate on the floor uh, as being the setting in which members are informed uh, and the language of the bill as being the context uh, in which they vote. Any realistic assessment of the congressional process accords enormous weight to uh, the workings of the committee system and the reliance that members who aren't on the committee place on the work of those who are on it. Uh, Gordon Kravitz? Well, uh, we've heard a justification for the reliance on legislative histories. It's based on an assumption that Congress ought to be able to regulate all those activities that Congress wants to regulate in whatever uh, means it uh, chooses for that purpose. And clearly, it is difficult to write uh, specific laws without reliance uh, on legislative histories in many areas uh, that the government now chooses to uh, regulate. Uh, the answer, though, I think is quite clear, which is that uh, Congress is trying to regulate areas of life in ways that are inappropriate. And the reliance on legislative histories is wonderful evidence that this is true. Um, it has always seemed to me uh, that the purpose of laws are to make uh, clear rules for the citizens of the country to live under, to have some notion of when they overstep the bounds of the law, to know when they might be held liable, to know when uh, uh, they've uh, polluted to a degree that is uh, unlawful, uh, to know when they may have committed a crime. And it seems uh, astonishing to me that we would uh, allow legislative history uh, to rule in any of those categories of, uh, of laws. Citizens of the United States do not read congressional committee reports. They do not read the congressional record. Uh, to the degree they know about laws, they know about one or two sentences of what the laws actually say. Uh, and it seems to me that it, it uh, raises very serious rule of law questions uh, to attempt to regulate people's lives uh, under some law congressional report statements by senators uh, uh, that people don't know about. Um, now, the laws of England were invoked earlier today. I think it's just worth pointing out that it's not impossible to write clear laws uh, in many areas of life. England uh, went through a socialist period uh, when judges continued to refuse to rely in anything like the way our judges do on parliamentary history. Uh, I don't think English draftsmen are better than our draftsmen. I think our congressmen uh, are better uh, able to avoid uh, responsibility and accountability uh, than members of parliament are because uh, they rely on vague laws uh, that require other branches of government to fill in uh, what the laws actually say, including the courts. I just want to take a minute to give you a feel for what uh, legislating is really like. I mean, this. Um, uh, my, my best source of information uh, about this is from a freshman member of Congress, Chris Cox, who some of you I'm sure know, who is a uh, White House counsel. Uh, he wrote this about uh, the days before the adjournment of the first session of the 101st Congress. Uh, in what is becoming a hallowed tradition, he wrote, with the current crop in Congress, not a single member of the House or Senate was permitted even to read the budget reconciliation bill before the vote on final passage. It wasn't even hauled into the chamber until moments before the vote was conducted in the wee hours. 
previously the record of this session for the longest bill passed without anyone's reading it was held by the SNL bailout bill. <laughs> Signed last August. That legislation, Congressman Cox said, was not even printed until the Monday after the vote. For sheer volume, he continued, the budget reconciliation measure won hands down. So voluminous was this monster bill that it was hauled into the chamber in an oversized cardboard box. It's thousands of pages, which the clerk hadn't even had time to number, had to be tied together with rope, like newspapers bundled for recycling. <laughs> While reading it was out of the question, Congressman Cox concluded, it is true that I was permitted to walk around the box. <laughs> and gaze upon it <laughs> from several angles <laughs> and even to touch it. <laughs> uh, so it does seem to me that defenders of legislative history have got a lot of explaining to do given the current practices of Congress. That is uh, not unlike a case we had when I was on the Fifth Circuit, OSHA had just been passed. And we had a lawyer arguing the legislative history. And I, find, I got the law to just see what it was. And I, I, I'm amazed to find it was over 700 pages. There's no one understood the legislative history of a 700 page law. And I asked the lawyer finally in the argument if he could find out if any congressman ever read it before it was passed. Of course, no one read it. It's over 700 pages of technical law. So that's the same thing with the budget. You know, they look at it maybe and somebody tells them a staff member may read it. But uh, I guess this tells us that we live in a complex society and uh, many of the laws are complex. Mike? Well, I don't know if there's anything I can say following that, but uh, <laughs> uh, probably the, the problem with that statute is there's not enough legislative history. They only held more hearings and held more debate. Uh, perhaps more might have been illuminated about that statute rather than the text, which is all that they were, were left with. I'd imagine that there are, are, are lots of sub-issues in, uh, in all of this. Um, there are, of course, uh, hearing reports, say, on appropriations matters which are not intended to explicate statutory language. Uh, they are political communications. Uh, the appropriation is an appropriation with fairly large numbers. Uh, the Congress uh, abandoning uh, early practices uh, from the first Congress on that, that time um, uh, has not provided line by line uh, $1,300 for this post office, uh, $5,675 for that toll road, uh, but appropriates money in larger amounts. There are political communications in committee reports, what the understanding of the Congress is. Legally, an administration would be quite free to ignore some amount of that additional language, but the political communication is this is the compact, this is the understanding. Um, if uh, spending is, uh, is done in a different way, there may be tighter controls the next time. It's a forecast and not a, uh, a legal command. That is sort of one area of, uh, of language in committee reports uh, that uh, is not intended for uh, the, the judgment of, of, of judges, but for the uh, action of administrators. Uh, there is legislative history that has um, not much to do with what is said on the floor, but how an act develops over time. Um, how a bill in one Congress which did not uh, achieve success is modified to be uh, more acceptable in another Congress. And simply looking at uh, the transformation in legislative language in the process of garnering more support is instructive of what it took to gain a democratic majority, small d democratic majority. Um, and, and therefore, without worrying whether the language was inserted by people outside of the process to influence it, 
influence it. Knowing how a statute develops is important, and that's part of legislative history. So it is one of those difficult subjects to paint broadly and either place it all outside the pale or all, all within it. Uh, we have three uh, designated questioners, Adam Meyerson of Policy Review, Charles Heatherly of Heritage Foundation, and Paul Gigot of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, any questioner, designated or not, should go to the microphone. Uh, I did, are you, uh, my name is Paul Gigot. Uh, I'd like to uh, see if I can uh, flesh out a, what I sense was a disagreement uh, between uh, my friend uh, and colleague Gordon Krovitz and the Attorney General. You both seem to agree that oversight has become excessive, has gone too far, but I want to know what is the remedy. The um, uh, Attorney General seemed to believe that uh, somehow the solution lies with uh, institutional reforms in Congress, but the uh, burden of uh, Gordon's remarks seemed to imply that the only answer was uh, an executive branch or a president that just said no. Uh, which is it? What's the solution? Is there one? I'll go first. The um, institutional reform, it'd be quite simple. It'd be something like uh, the uh, Council on Legislation in the British Parliament. You can't introduce a bill until it goes through um, the council. Uh, we would have, you couldn't have a hearing. You couldn't set off on an oversight investigation unless some council, which probably is a leadership in the House or the Senate, respectively, would agree to it. I have uh, dealt with the Congress over the years a great deal, and uh, when I first became Attorney General, we had more than 40 committees in the House looking into foreign intelligence, more than 40 subcommittees and committees. Uh, the Senate had, uh, under Attorney General Levy, had agreed to set up the Senate Select Committee on Foreign Intelligence. I then got the House to set up the same kind of a committee, and the problem was almost instantly solved. You don't hear any more about hearings on foreign intelligence other than the Iran-Contra investigation, which you'd have to say was an aberration, but uh, these two select committees just handle it. They put discipline in the system. And that is the only way to bring the oversight problem under control as I see it. I have confidence, though, in the, in the Congress that they would do that. Uh, that's the reason I suggested they ought to go and study what, what it is they're about for and not just keep going like they're going. Uh, some of these uh, investigations have nothing at all to do with uh, legislative functions, as I can see. They're just stirring up uh, publicity, stirring up dust, and uh, just to uh, make somebody look good as having hearings. Those kind ought to be brought under control and can be brought under control. Uh, one problem, the other problem is they have too many people in the, in the Congress, uh, not, not members, but staff. The staff's too large. If they cut down on the old site, they'd have a lot of people unemployed. They wouldn't be unemployed, but they just wouldn't have anything to do. They'd be a... Uh... <laughs> that, that keeps it from happening. I, I, I'd assumed, actually, that somebody, uh, a fellow member of the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, would direct a uh, tough question to somebody else. Um, <laughs> Paul, we'll have to talk. Um, I, it seems to me that the uh, reforms, so-called, of the 70s that uh, broke down the seniority system in Congress are, in, to some degree, to blame for the current problem. I don't know who it is now, but uh, somebody uh, made famous the uh, notion that if you ever see a member of Congress, a Democratic member of Congress, and can't remember his name, it's safe to refer to him as Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> and I think that so long as that uh, system uh, uh, is what we have to work with, there are always going to be incentives to uh, have hearings and investigations uh, for publicity purposes, and if not for actual legislation. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, by the executive just saying no in some uh, form might be doing uh, legislators a favor uh, by pulling them back from that system to some uh, uh, system that more resembles the way Congress has traditionally operated, which is with some controls from within. Uh, I, I don't think Congress is likely to come to that on its own. It's uh, uh, public choice theorists can explain quite clearly why uh, individual members have a different interest than the institution as a whole. Uh, but it does seem to me that uh, the executive branch ought to do whatever it can to uh, help Congress out in this way. 
I'm Adam Meyerson from Policy Review. I have three related questions for the panelists, especially Mr. Bell and Mr. Krovitz. Uh, first, what are the most important potential abuses of power in the executive in an executive branch that's much, much larger than anything envisioned by the founders? Uh, second, what role, if any, should Congress play in guarding against those abuses of power? And third, if not Congress, who? Um, I'll, I'll go first, if, if you don't mind. Uh, I think that uh, one example of a uh, tremendous abuse of power that is not only possible by the executive branch, but I think uh, happens with some uh, unfortunate regularity, is in criminal prosecutions. Uh, I have in mind particularly uh, some of the uses of RICO by certain U.S. attorneys. Uh, now, RICO is precisely the kind of statute under which U.S. attorneys are given tremendous uh, discretion uh, and uh, tremendous powers uh, to punish before uh, any conviction, uh, to freeze assets, to bankrupt companies before trials. Uh, but all of that discretion is given to U.S. attorneys by Congress. Uh, I think it's widely acknowledged that the RICO statute is not used in anything like what Congress intended in 1970 based on legislative history or anything else. Uh, uh, but Congress has not gotten its act together uh, to uh, change RICO despite two uh, Supreme Court cases where uh, by now all nine justices have uh, pointed out to Congress that it's being used in a way that uh, they clearly never intended. Uh, so the, the role of Congress in limiting abuses of power by the executive branch, I think, is very important. Uh, but Congress, uh, for whatever reason, seems incapable of dealing with this uh, rather obvious problem, a statute that everybody uh, knows about and that uh, almost all members of Congress, I think, would acknowledge in private, if not in public, uh, that it's being used in ways that uh, they uh, never intended. Uh, so to the, and to, the, to answer the question, if not Congress, who, I think that in the RICO uh, uh, case, the answer is nobody. Uh, so Congress has tremendous responsibilities uh, in areas like this that it is not meeting, and it is not meeting it in part because it's spending its time uh, doing other things, including uh, hearings and investigations. Well, I'll just add to that that uh, it goes without saying that the old site power is needed. I don't think any of us are trying to abolish it. We just think it's, at least I think it, it's uh, being used excessively. It certainly is needed. And that's the systems of checks and balances that came to us under the Constitution. Uh, the Congress watches the president, and the president, to some extent, I guess, watches the Congress, but, and the courts uh, watch both. Uh, and they prevent abuses of power, the courts do. But only the, uh, they have certain uh, narrow areas where they have, they have too much power, power's not under control, and one is in the criminal prosecution area. Uh, but you have to understand how the system works to understand how there can be an abuse. I've always thought that the U.S. attorneys ought to be selected by the attorney general, and they ought to work for the attorney general because the pre president delegates the part of his power to faithfully execute the laws to the attorney general. And that includes the discretion to prosecute or not to prosecute. The president delegates that. But in fact, most of the U.S. attorneys are selected by senators. Uh, I was once in a western state and called it, uh, when I traveled, I'd always call on the, uh, the Justice Department people in, you know, in a way where I happen to be. And there was a picture of the senator from that state in the U.S. Attorney's Office on the wall. <laughs> and I said, well, why don't you have a picture of President Carter? He said he had nothing to do with my appointment. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the big jobs that the Attorney General has is to keep the U.S. attorneys under control. If you don't know that when you start out being Attorney General, you won't be there too long. <laughs> That's how you prevent the abuse of power. Know, know what the chain of command is and, and have discipline and make people follow the chain of command. Otherwise, you, you shouldn't be have the president delegate that vast power to, to you. You ought to just say to him, I can't manage it. I can't handle it. That's too much discretion for me. Too many people to deal with. 
And you just have to fire people once in a while, too. I mean, that's all part of the, part of the deal. One day we'll get back to that. Uh, you've got to keep people under control. That is a way to keep from having a, an abuse of power. Always have a set chain of command, always have disciplines, always have checks to see what's going on. Judge Silverman. Well, so I have a question for those of you who decry the, what you believe is the excess of congressional investigation of the executive branch as opposed to legislation. Last night we heard Professor Epstein give a brilliant, if slightly wicked, a defense of separation of powers based on the, in a time of divided government, based on the assumption that separation of powers in a time of divided government would cause stalemate, therefore less government growth. Does it not also follow from that that the citizenry is in, their position is enhanced insofar as Congress is encouraged to spend all of its time torturing the executive branch <laughs> rather than passing laws? Federal Society panels are no place for second best answers. <laughs> yes, Paul Kaminar from the Washington Legal Foundation. Using the uh, North case as an example, the current skirmishes, legal skirmishes deal with whether or not prosecutors and witnesses have been exposed to immune testimony. My question is more fundamental, and that is, where under our system of separated powers does a committee of the Congress get the constitutional authority to offer immunity to prosecution? As Judge Ballot just said, the discretion of prosecution is an executive function. And immunity from prosecution is also purely an executive function. In that case, uh, uh, Oliver North should have been the potted plant at, at the hearings and, and just refused to answer any questions. Um, because if, in fact, uh, a committee does have that power, uh, what prevents a, co sub a committee today from giving immunity to Noriega to have him come up and testify about his drug running deals and so forth and thereby preclude the executive from prosecuting that individual? There is some authority where the court, a district court had tried to offer prosecution to a witness on the stand and told the prosecutor to uh, give immunity. The prosecutor refused. The district court says, well, then I'm offering uh, immunity. And the Courts of Appeals struck that down saying, no, immunity from prosecution is an exclusive executive power. So my question is, where does the Committee of Congress get the authority to offer immunity? It's on the separation of powers. They have, a, they have the right to inquire, the Congress does, and they uh, uh, can punish you for contempt if you fail to answer. So that's if, correct. Uh, that's the contempt of the Congress. That's, that's like two, two different governments. Uh, the Congress has got their own rules, and if Oliver North had not responded after they gave him immunity, they could have then prosecuted him for contempt. It would have been their own prosecution. Just, it wouldn't have anything to do with the Department of Justice. But could now, they, have to, they have to be very careful when they do that to uh, uh, give someone uh, use immunity and not transactional immunity. If you gave transactional immunity, they would be uh, interfering with the Department of Justice's right to prosecute. So they, in that case, they, they attempted to give use immunity. Uh, well, whatever he said there couldn't be used against him. Uh, that's all a very technical, fine line to follow, but that's, that's, that's the law as I understand it. If I could just pick up on, uh, on Judge Bell's uh, response. Uh, Testimonial immunity is provided pursuant to statute signed by the president. So that was a, an outgrowth of a, a legislative process. It, did not, it was not an assertion of inherent congressional power to give any kind of immunity. There have been at times in history uh, statutes which permitted uh, or required the grant of uh, transactional immunity, and those have been modified and brought down to testimonial immunity so that the executive may prosecute. Uh, and there, isn't, there is a process, uh, testy at times, as uh, in, in the case of Iran-Contra witnesses, most times amicable, in which um, the Department of Justice and committees of, of the Congress conciliate differences as to whether witnesses should be called under immunity. So then Noriega could be given immunity if a committee of Congress wanted to... He could, be, he, he could be given testimonial immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it use immunity, but it's the same I, thing. Uh, yes, he could, that could happen just as it happened in the case of Colonel North. 
Uh, I don't imagine Congress is going to call no rega, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we'll see. Uh, I practice in an area of law in which uh, legislative history has run riot uh, over the last year, the minor area known as the Internal Revenue Code, um, uh, in which one can uh, find thousands of ex examples from any, any one of a number of uh, sub-pieces of legislation of congressional attempts to legislate through the uh, use of uh, the record. Um, whether it's the Ways and Means Committee reports or the Finance Committee reports or the Joint Committee reports or the infamous Blue Book, um, there are a thousand examples of that. My, my point, and I guess my question uh, to you all is, um, isn't the use of legislative history a means by which Congress uh, gets around the institutional limitation inherent in legislation, that is, um, uh, the production of 700 page, other, what would otherwise require 700 pages of uh, legislation, uh, what would otherwise require um, perhaps not midnight um, changes in the legislation, which seems to be the, the, the latest thing in, in, in tax legislation, getting together at the last minute and, and uh, throwing something into the legislation at the joint uh, uh, at the committee meetings. Uh, in addition to which, would, doesn't it also uh, enable Congress to perhaps uh, override its natural, or what might otherwise be a natural inclination, not to become too intrusive, simply because it would require a vast amount of detail, a vast size, uh, huge bills, and a lot more work and effort uh, to produce a bill that didn't require quite so much regulation or quite so much information provided in the, uh, in the legislative history. And I think it's the best illustration of that is what I uh, uh, learned about the, uh, about the uh, the budget reconciliation bill here today and uh, is, is what I would view as an institutional corruption uh, by, by which a bill gets passed um, by, uh, by how, you know, how, it, how it feels, how, you t how, much, how close you can get to the bill, but not how close you can get to reading it. Um, Any panelists want to? Well, I'll, I'll say a, a, a couple of things. The burden of my remarks was to was to invite you to think about the fact that the agency is the, a participant in this process when it occurs. I mean to put forward no brief for 700 page unread bills. They're garbage uh, and their history ought to be so regarded. Not all bills have that character and some of the conversation proceeds as if all did. Um, the agency is a participant uh, in the development of legislation. And that participation contributes to what I describe as the rule of law culture within the agency, and one ought to be very careful about putting that aside. A lot of remarks that have been made this morning, remarks in which I current, thoroughly concur, have to do with discipline, or if you like, with courage. One of the important differences between our system and the English system, which has been mentioned a couple of times, is that that is a system with discipline. It's a system where the executive and the legislative cannot come from different parties, uh, where debate uh, is, if anything, more of a sideshow than it is here, because the for final form of the bill can be completely controlled within the political party that is going to enact the bill. Uh, and our problem, in some respects, is dealing with the issues that um, uh, that, that uh, uh, presents for us. Um, I do think that one can look quite outside the legislative process in the Congress and see that the use of explanatory documents of one kind or another, uh, understanding of the context, as, as Mike put it, I thought quite eloquent, uh, quite eloquently, is an element that all of us are accustomed to use and to rely on. One example that comes to mind is the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, it comes not only as a code text, but with enormous, an enormous body of negotiated out comments and explanations and so forth and so on. We all understand that those aren't part of the law and also that they provide an important context within which to understand it. I'll add uh, on the IRS that they are, they are almost an exception because you never know what the law is until they write the regulations. <laughs> and in a sense, they, the regulations are memorializing the legislative history. It's a backward process. and. Um, I'm not a tax lawyer, but we, I know a lot of tax lawyers in the, in the organization I'm with, and they, that's what they, what they tell me. That you can ask them a question. Immediately after Congress passes a change in the IRS and the code, and they say, we can't do a thing about that now until the regulations are written. 
And that might not be a bad uh, system for other agencies to follow. After the law is passed, memorialize the meaning by regulations. I, 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 I'd been saying it make uh, be it would beat the system we have in some some instances now. I perhaps expressed myself inartfully. I, I, I suppose that the point that I was trying to get at was whether by permitting Congress to, in effect, uh, direct uh, the, re the uh, regulatory result by legislative history, you have to understand that these blue books, as the Joint Committee staff reports are referred to, for any major piece of legislation run a thousand pages, um, a lot of which is devoted to little comments like, well, we meant uh, when we said uh, a guarantee that, well, a guarantee in the ordinary course would still be okay. There's nothing in the nothing in the statute that refers to guarantees or of that sort. My point being that if you've compelled Congress to shrink the legislative history, shrink the blue book to 10 pages, and put what was in the blue book in the, in the, in the legislation, you would have one or two effects. You would either prevent Congress from acting, which many of us would feel would be a very nice thing. Um, I, I know a lot of the people where I come from uh, sort of express the viewpoint that the best part of Congress is their annual Christmas break. Um, um, I know as a tax lawyer, we're certainly looking forward to a year of rest, but I guess it's not about to happen. Um, but my point is, I guess, that, that it would prevent Congress from acting. In other words, this is an institutional check on congressional over-legislation, let's say, that you overcome by saying, well, okay, we'll pass a simple piece of legislation, we'll have the staff write a thousand pages of legislative history, pass the buck to, to the... Uh, to the uh, executive, uh, and therefore continue to, to uh, impose our will uh, on, on the people without uh, providing for expl explicit uh, legislation. And, and going forth from that, it, it would seem to me it would raise the question of whether or not Congress is intruding too deeply into the lives of, 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 uh, of its constituents if it is unable to pass legislation that is clear enough Shouldn't that be a warning sign to the Congress that perhaps they've passed some boundary beyond which they shouldn't go? Because it requires thousands and thousands of pages to uh, control the behavior of their constituents. I, that's, that's, I think, where I was headed. Any panelists I don't know if there's any I'll, I'll just take a shot at it. He, uh, what you're suggesting is everything be written by a committee. No one would be able to understand it. And uh, we can't have a moratorium on laws that was too complex. I, when I was about your age, I once made a statement that we ought to have a two-year moratorium on laws. <laughs> and Senator Russell, I later saw, and he said, well, you can't do that. He said, when I was your age, I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> but he, said, he said, the world is too complex. We've got too many problems. We, so we got to have a workable system. And we wouldn't, no, no one would understand the law if it's written by a committee. So we've got to, the system we got now is working. It may not, it may need a little oiling, but it's, it's working. And we ought not to make it too complex and too hard. We, it never been a law written that was so, on, if it's over a paragraph that you couldn't argue about. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Clay Smith. I'm, I teach at Howard Law School. I was struck by Professor Strauss's comments and it reminded me of uh, some writings of uh, Professor Wexler and, and his notions on the majoritarian process. And I put this question to you, Professor Strauss, and uh, for others who may wish to respond, and that is whether or not legislative history is a product of or a tool of ascertaining civic virtue, which if disregarded by the third branch and others, is a negation of civic virtue, uh, which Professor Wexler intimates is lodged in the majoritarian process. The people only have an opportunity to elect, to have access to the government through the process of electing a president, perhaps through the APA by filing comments, uh, and uh, if they are brought into the, the judicial system either by prosecution or if they sue on their rights. So the, one, of the, one of the other accesses to uh, is through the states and through this through the elected representative. So if the courts are now going to limit or not use legislative history, uh, aren't we to some degree negating uh, some aspect of or uh, some aspects of uh, this term uh, of civic virtue? Well, I, I think it's certainly the case that if, it, if judges were 
regularly to refuse to educate themselves in the political background of legislation in the sense that, uh, that Mike Davidson uh, was raising earlier. Uh, we would quickly see a return to the kind of disreputable judging that characterized the country. Uh, maybe not everyone here will agree with this characterization as disreputable, but that characterized the country in the period, say, 1885 to uh, 1920, um, when judges thought all they had to do was to read a statute and they would know what it was about. Um, that seems to me not desirable from the perspective of political responsibility, and I thought we had learned that lesson. Yes, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Roger Pilon, Cato Institute. Uh, Gordon, I have the distinct uh, displeasure of having to ask you a somewhat unfriendly question, which I'll try to ask in as friendly a way as I can. Uh, I'm anxious to know, in general, how uh, broad you intend your broadside against congressional oversight to be. Uh, let me uh, draw my example from an issue, from an area that I believe I know your sentiments in, uh, just to make it a little less fair, and uh, and uh, use the uh, current Chinese students bill uh, as an example. As you know, the issues that are buried there are, are those uh, that involve the uh, administration, the president, and the attorney general assuring Congress that uh, these uh, tens of thousands of cases will be fairly adjudicated by the Immigration and Naturalization Service. The Congress in, its, in, a, in a surprising show of wisdom is, uh, is uh, somewhat skeptical of this claim. Uh, you also know that um, the way the process works is that the order may indeed go out from the president and the attorney general, but in the bowels of that building, an image I choose from personal experience, the uh, orders will get lost, indeed will get perverted, and uh, accordingly, uh, the, uh, the uh, issue of oversight of congressional intent in this area looms very large. Of course, you can say there are remedies, administrative remedies, and eventually remedies in the courts, but we know we're asking since the administration with uh, a thousand and one things on its plate simply can't reach deeply into every corner of its vast domain. Perhaps you'd care to comment on this. Sure. Well, I, I hope, Roger, you don't view this as a uh, cop-out, but if there is something as uh, important as uh, immigration and citizenship and those uh, kinds of issues, I think it's all the more important that Congress pass simple legislation giving uh, uh, Congress, after all, does have constitutional authority, uh, express authority uh, in this particular area. I think if, if Congress wanted to uh, ensure fair treatment of the Chinese students or other immigrants, uh, what Congress would do instead of considering a new immigration bill uh, that for the first time uh, will limit the number of immigrants, uh, Congress could easily take away executive discretion by passing a statute declaring open borders. Uh, that seems to me to be a pretty good solution to uh, that problem, both procedurally and substantively. Uh, but there are, I mean, clearly there are areas uh, where uh, congressional oversight can improve uh, the policy. The question, though, I think always is, uh, is it oversight that you need or is it clearer laws that you need? And I think that uh, whether you take immigration or inside trading laws, which you know are, are intentionally non-defined by Congress, uh, that what Congress ought to do is go and define what it wants to do or get out of the area of regulating through a simple provision such as open borders or uh, uh, some other uh, policy decision. I mean, clarity is always an enemy of uh, perfection through detail, and that's, that's the trade-off, and Congress is not, I don't think, acknowledged that trade-off exists. Well, on the uh, immigration power uh, policy, the Congress uh, under the Constitution has what is known as plenary power over, over that. They have more power over immigration than doing normal things. Uh, I guess it would be almost equal to the power to uh, appropriate money, uh, tax bills have to originate in the House. That's something I learned when I was a judge, that they have plenary power, and then when I became Attorney General, uh, the attorney, under the law then, the Attorney General had uh, the authority to make exceptions uh, to let people in to the country. And the President asked me one day how I had that power instead of him. And I said, well, the Congress gave it to me. And he said, well, what do I have to do with it? I said, very little, very little, because Congress has plenary power. 
And so uh, if the president had uh, people he wanted to let in, he'd call me on the telephone, and I'd have to put get a, study it and decide what to do because I had to answer to the Congress. This is a very peculiar thing in the law, but it, it's only applies in the area of immigration. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a short break now and return promptly at 1130 for the next panel.